We continue with our fourth series of lectures on human social relations and this evening draw your attention to the most important subject of the social relations which Christians should sustain in all fields of life towards non-Christians. This is not easy. One of the most difficult problems with which we are all faced is what attitude we as Christians should adopt toward non-Christians. You see, on the one hand, all men are God's creatures, including the non-Christians. So all men should be treated with respect, even if some men deny their divine origin. But on the other hand, only Christians are God's children. In the long haul, peaceful coexistence between the lost and the saved in the same world is impossible. There can be short-term coexistence after a fashion, but not in the long haul. Finally, either the Christians will yield the field to the non-Christians, or the non-Christians will yield the field to the Christians. It's as simple as that, and may I interject something else? To put this into political terms, in the long haul, the United States will yield the field to the Soviet Union the other way around. It's that simple. So we'd better decide once and for all who is going to win. Meantime, the vital question arises, what relation should Christians sustain toward non-Christians? I think we need a few definitions. Now, by the word Christians, we do not mean those who go to church, although hopefully many who do <laughs> would be Christians, but by Christians we mean that part of mankind all over the world who by God's grace alone has been recreated in Christ Jesus unto true knowledge, true righteousness, and true holiness. Christians are not yet perfect, but they have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God. And Christians are more and more increasing their service to the Lord in all things as they attempt to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. By non-Christians, we mean that other part of humanity which has not yet been, or sadly never will be, recreated by the, serv by the Savior. Now, in varying degrees and in different ways, these non-Christians may have many virtues which they would have only due to the operation of God's common grace in their lives, which common grace will, of course, not save them. But notwithstanding all of this, and notwithstanding any lip service that non-Christians may pay to the existence of God, they are still, in the last analysis, opposed to acknowledging Christ's authority over their lives. And some of them, of course, are found, sad to say, even in the churches. They may even claim to love the Lord, but the Jesus said, By their fruits ye shall know them. As a man thinketh, so is he. So the $64,000 question is, Who do we love more than anyone else in the world, including more than our wife, more than our children? If we cannot, with a clean conscience, say, Jesus Christ, very frankly, no matter how nice we are, we're not yet Christians. It's that simple. In the last analysis, non-Christians are people with guilty consciences who in varying degrees, unrighteously and inexcusably, hold down or suppress the truth which God has revealed of himself in nature to all men from the very creation of the world. This is the answer to the old chestnut, oh, well, the heathen will be saved because they're ignorant of Christ. No, the heathen will not be saved because they're not ignorant of God. Every time they see a flower open, that flower says, God made me, worship him. And the heathen, who's never read the Bible, deliberately ignores the testimony that the flower preaches. Therefore, Paul says, he's without excuse. Now, although there are varying degrees of conscious commitment to Christ 
amongst Christians and varying degrees of conscious commitment to Satan among non-Christians. Some non-Christians are active Satanists, willfully and knowingly worship the devil, very few I think. Others just couldn't care less and haven't crystallized it quite that far. And yet the difference between all Christians and all non-Christians is not just a difference of quantity. It's not that the Christians have more light than the non-Christians. The difference is qualitative. Christians are different kind of people uh, to the non-Christians. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. Moreover, although even the believer only knows in part, the status of the unbeliever is actually one of knowing nothing at all and of being destitute of the truth, according to Paul. You know, this is so important for us to remember. How frequently have we met Christians who, aware of their own sinfulness, are hesitant to be too assertive towards non-Christians. And we wouldn't be that hesitant if we recognized that non-Christians really don't know anything in the last analysis. And even though we know we're stupid, <laughs> there is a sense in which we know all things because uh, we have the unction of the Holy Spirit. It's not that we're smart, but it's because God who is smart is in us by his grace. Well now, the question is, how should the children of life attempt to live in the same world as the children of wrath. That's the problem. I think the best place to start uh, the answer to this important question that we're all faced with is round the issue of predestination. Now, before the foundation of the world, the triune God predestinated some of the angels and men that he had not yet created to be saved and he predestinated others to be lost. He did all of this to the praise of his own greater glory. So from this sense, that is from God's viewpoint, we should say that the fall was foreordained even before creation. This is clearly taught by scripture, no matter how, uh, how harsh this may seem to some of us. You see, even Satan and his children were divinely predetermined to play their role as fallen angels and later as fallen men in the unfolding of this God-created universe to the praise of the Lord's own glory. But notwithstanding this, God nevertheless created both Lucifer and man in perfect righteousness and holiness. Uh, we are not wrong when we say God did not create the devil. That statement is true. God did not create the devil. He did create Lucifer, who became the devil. Now, Lucifer, before his fall, and man before his fall, were under no constraint to fall into sin. They did so by the free exercise of their own free will. This is a very great mystery to us. The greater mystery, of course, is, well, God did create them with an ability to fall, which is true. If Lucifer had not fallen into sin, there would never have been any antagonism between the good angels and the fallen angels. Nor could man himself ever have fallen into sin, because Lucifer would have to become the devil who would have to tempt man before it would be possible for man to fall into sin. Although Lucifer fell into sin and thus became Satan, there was still no necessity, even after that, for man to fall into sin. Indeed, if man had not fallen into sin, there would never have been any human rebels against God. There would have been no antagonism between man and man, between Christians and non-Christians, the only antagonism there would have then have been would have been that between mankind and Satan. And this is a very, very important point. I'm going to develop this as we go through the lecture. Folks, the real antagonism that we Christians should feel is not against non-Christians. 
but against Satan. And we should call upon the non-Christians to join the winning team. And I think it's the failure, particularly of so many Bible-believing Christians, often fundamentalist Christians, to see this, which unnecessarily makes them think that the world, the world of men is their enemy. It isn't. The enemy is the devil, and he's a cruel taskmaster. And it is our mission to free mankind from the clutches of Satan. It is not our mission to eradicate non-Christians. In fact, if we think it is our mission, it's just possible they may try to eradicate us. So then, even today, the Christian's basic battle is not against unbelieving men, it is against Satan who holds unbelieving men captive. Now let's look at God's covenant with mankind. It's of great importance to understand that notwithstanding predestination, and here is a very, very important point that has caused all kinds of controversy in the last five years to rage between Campus Crusade on the one hand and some hyper-Calvinist elements on the other. It's important for us to realize that God does have a positive benevolence feeling of well-being toward humanity as a whole and a positive enmity against Satan. Thus God erected his covenant with the whole of mankind in the Garden of Eden where God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, fill the whole earth. See, it involves the whole of mankind and subdue it. Now, as men would have obeyed this covenantal command, they would have been fruitful, they would have multiplied, and they would have filled the earth. That is, if they hadn't fallen into sin. Of course, they're still doing it today, but now they're doing it, for the most part, as those who have fallen into sin. Without sin, men would have left their fathers and mothers and cleaved to their wives and trekked further into all the world, being fruitful and multiplying until the earth would have been filled with the children of God. Man and woman, you see, before the fall, were not religiously neutral creatures, but they were indeed children of God even before the fall. But with this difference, before the fall, Adam and Eve were children of God who could lose that childhood of God, and who did. Whereas we Christians are children of God who cannot lose our childship of God. That's why Augustine says, O oh, blessed fall! We've received more back in Christ than we had before the fall. Because in Christ we have unlosable everlasting life, whereas poor old Adam only had losable everlasting life and he lost it before Christ restored it to him. So you see, we are better off in Christ, even after the fall, than we would have been without Christ's incarnation, even if we hadn't fallen. Now, if Adam and Eve and their children had never lost that sonship of God, and they didn't have to lose it if they'd remained obedient. If they hadn't lost it, all men would have been believing servants of the triune Lord. All men would then have lived in perfect harmony with one another too. In other words, there would have been no problem then as to the relationship between Christians and non-Christians. Now, God has not ditched this world and left it to rot. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God created the world not that it should remain void and empty. He created the world that it be inhabited. Thus saith the Lord, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the world. So I think you can already catch the drift of my argument, uh, and that is that God purposes to have a saved world, even though that is hardly 
the condition in which we find ourselves today, even after 20 centuries uh, of the operation of the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost in this world. Now, the sad chapter which has created our problem, the fall of man. The possibility of man's falling away was first foreshadowed, even before the fall, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which man was required to abstain from. Again, such a possibility of apostasy was also emphasized by the requirement that man keep or guard the garden, that is, guard it against Satan. For God made a covenant of life treaty with the first man, that is, with man and woman, by which treaty God and man were to be allied together with one another and against Satan and death. This is very important. The covenant that God made with Adam and Eve before the fall drew them together, God and man, but antithetically addressed itself against Satan. It's as if, as Abram Kuyper points out in one of his beautiful works, The Doctrine of the Covenants, that God made a deal with Adam before the fall and said, Adam, we're buddies. Now I will help you against our common enemy, but you have got to uphold me against the common enemy. Here's the garden. Keep it. Guard it. Be warned someone's going to try and get in and when he does resist now this is important because when we realize this we see that the fall was not just a matter of eating a bad apple and of God losing his temper because of a very trivial transgression it was a it was it was high treason against God it was a breach of a covenant more important than an international covenant, a covenant between God and man, that's what man willfully broke. And when we see this, we see the enormity of the first sin in the garden. Now, the everlasting life which God promised men, he signified by the tree of life. The threatened death, if man broke the covenant, God signified by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This means every time man looked at the tree of life in the garden, he knew that it was God's purpose to give man unlosable, everlasting life if man remained faithful. And every time man looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden before the fall, in looking at that tree, God reminded man that if man ever broke his covenant with God, God would punish him with the evil that the tree pointed to. Now, when man broke this covenant with God, this covenant with God and against the devil, man treasonously, and here is another enormous and horrible fact, by breaking the covenant, man treasonously allied himself with Satan, with death and with hell, against God. But God was still on a bound to come to the aid of man as his traitorous ally. That wonderful statement in Timothy, if we are unfaithful, God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Oh, that's a blessed promise. That means no matter how depraved I am, God will not let me go. He comes to the aid of me, his wayward covenant ally. I've declared war against God, but God says I'm not having that. I'm still your ally, and I am going to destroy the person that you wrongly think is your friend, namely the devil. And you see at the end, it's me that's your friend and, and not the devil. When we were yet sinners, enemies against God, Christ died for us at the right time. That's how much God loves the world of mankind. And so we read in Isaiah 28, rich, rich thoughts. Thus saith the Lord, though you have said, that we have made a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Your covenant with death and with hell shall not stand. For behold, I lay in Zion a precious stone, a chief cornerstone, and he that believeth in him 
shall not be confounded. Of course, that's our Lord Jesus in the power of his resurrection who destroyed the head of Satan. So then God promises that he himself will come and destroy man's covenant with death and with hell by God himself liberating mankind from the clutches of Satan. Again, God's true enemy is not man, but Satan. Now let's look at the restoration of man. God promised to do all of this in the Protevangelium, that is, the first gospel promise, Genesis 3.15, right after the fall. You remember? God warned the devil right after the fall. God said to the devil who had subverted mankind, Devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and the woman's seed. He, the seed of the woman, that is the Lord Jesus, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Mankind would be punished, oh yes. Women would be subjected, at least for a time, to their husbands, and men would have to pit their strength against thorns and thistles. And yet, God's covenant with mankind would continue without abrogation. Why? Because that great hero, the seed of a woman, the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Lord, would ultimately come to earth and utterly crush the serpent's head. Now notice that God in no way withdrew his original covenant with man just because man had betrayed him. To the contrary, woman would still be fruitful and multiply, although she would henceforth do so in sorrow. Man would still subdue and have dominion over the earth, although now he would have to do it in the sweat of his face. And God's earth would still be populated by man, although now, especially through the agency of the Christian gospel, Go ye into all the world and subdue the earth. Now, ultimately, Christ's gospel will save the world. For Christ came to save the world, not to destroy it. To save the world, including the world of man. But before this is achieved, and it's still a long way off from being achieved, before this is achieved by the triumphant spread of the gospel everywhere, the fight will rage long and strong. The fight between Christ and Satan. The fight between Christians as the seed of the seed of the woman and non-Christians as the seed of the seed of the serpent. The fight between the children of God and the children of the devil. But the ultimate outcome of this struggle is certain. For Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. And, while ever expanding that earthly reign of his, Jesus is even now already reigning over all earthlings from his heavenly throne. 1 Corinthians 15.25 Jesus must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. Meantime, here and now, the children of God are to overcome the children of the devil and to conquer the world. You may want to put that word conquer in quotation marks. I'll define it a little better later. We are to conquer the world for our Lord and King. But the question is how? What is our modus vivendi? What should our style of life be in the world in our relationship to the non-Christians to which group we ourselves belonged before we became Christians, what it should our attitude be toward the unbeliever until Christ completes his conquest? Well, Christians are to set about the conquest of the world and all its inhabitants in the name of King Jesus. Now, this is not a physical conquest. That was the terrible mistake that the Spanish Inquisition made. Some Puritans have made the same mistake. You cannot force people to become Christians. Though very frankly, if by forcing people to become Christians, I could make them Christians, I would use physical force. And you know why? Because 
hell lasts an awful long time for the non-Christian. And if you're fortunate to become a Christian, if you could, even though he'd hate you for doing it on earth, he'd thank you for doing it one second after he was dead. But in point of fact, you cannot force people to become Christians. It, uh, it cannot be done. So there's no sense in trying, even if you are well-intentioning. The conquest then we're talking about is not a physical conquest, but a spiritual conquest by the Christians of the non-Christians. But it is a Christian conquest. And I think the greatest tragedy of the church today is the refusal of the church, by and large, to see that we are out to conquer the world. Why is America going down the drain? And I'm not saying everyone in America is a Christian, but why is America going down the drain? The simple reason is it's no longer out to conquer the world for American influence. Misguided people really think that you can peacefully coexist with, with evil power wielders elsewhere. It can't be done. Uh, this is then a Christian conquest. Long-term peaceful coexistence between the saved and the lost on the same planet is impossible. Ultimately, one of these two parties must yield to the other so it's about time that Christians made up their mind whether they're going to yield or whether the other parties are going to yield. Now, in setting about the spiritual conquest of those who regard Christ as their enemy, and may I say here, look at Romans 5.10 very carefully, it does not say that God is mad at the unbeliever and that he sees the unbelievers as his enemy, it says the unbelievers are mad at God and that they regard God as their enemy. Big difference between those two. Remember, God is still well disposed toward the whole of mankind uh, and by covenantal obligation out to redeem as many of mankind as he has chosen. So Christians are first and always to remember that they themselves were formerly at enmity with Christ, just as the non-Christians still are. When Christians remember this, it will give them the necessary compassion. Thus they will never forget that the real battle should, not, should be joined not so much between Christians and non-Christians, but the real battle should rather be joined now let's listen carefully. The real battle should be joined between all mankind on the one hand and the devil on the other hand. Our problem then is to tell non-Christians to be really human. <laughs> we should tell non-Christians to be real men. They need to oppose the devil. If they won't do this to that extent, they are allowing the devil to dehumanize them. You see, this is a, this is a very interesting thrust in approaching the, the, non, the non-believer. We must appeal to him to be a real man. And if he says, well, what does a real man look like? We should say what Pilate said and point to Jesus and say, Eki homo, behold the man, there he is. That's our leader, that's our captain, let's follow him. When we do this, the unbeliever is more easily going to see us as someone who would befriend him rather than someone who's out to get him or rob him of his joy or whatever. Even then we're going to have problems, but uh, I think we're going to get much further with that kind of a stance than we do by beating someone over the head with the Bible. <laughs> uh, and sometimes it is necessary to beat them over the head with the Bible, but um, we've got to understand that that we should present ourselves to him as his friend and not as his enemy. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, Christians should never forget that the real battle should be joined between all mankind and the devil rather than between Christians and non-Christians. Now, Christians are the vanguard, the leaders of the new humanity, the true humanity. Christians should call upon all men everywhere to follow Christ as the great liberator and to oppose the works of Satan. I don't know what you think about E. Stanley Jones. Well, he was a Methodist, and some would say he was to some extent liberal. 
but he's written a lot of very interesting books. Uh, Christ on the Indian Road, and Christ on the This Road, and Christ on the That Road. And after being a missionary in India and seeing all of that poverty and superstition and misery, he wrote his book, Christ on the Indian Road, round just a few texts in the Gospel according to Luke. And he says, This is the program for the enslaved East. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to those held captive to make known the pleasant year of the Lord, the Jubilee, to preach liberation to those held captive by the devil. Now, of course, some of the people with the social gospel give this an unfortunate slant. And yet, I really believe that the way in which we should be presenting Christ, particularly to the undeveloped world today, which is the greater part of them, is to look upon Christ as the great liberator. Not a liberator from capitalism, but the great liberator from the devil, from Satan. Christus Liberator. Second, Christians in the power of the Holy Spirit must seek to convert all men whom they meet to the side of Jesus Christ. Christians should point out to the non-Christians that those non-Christians are diminishing their own humanity when they follow the degrading perversions of the old serpent and that their only way of attaining joy and developing a true humanity lies in their turning right around and following Jesus Christ as the friend of man and as the only real hope of mankind. Now third, Christians must warn non-Christians of the dire consequences of their continued refusal to follow Christ. Not only will the non-Christians, if they continue to resist Christ, forfeit earthly blessings, but they will also be subjected to more and more earthly punishments. And if they die still unconverted, they will be exposed to endless torments in the lake of fire. You know, if we will not tell unbelievers this, and it's a solemn subject, we don't love them as much as we should. Christians are instrumental in offering the non-Christians blessings, yes. But God will use even non-Christians to meet out his wrath on obdurate non-Christians who will not heed his word. Um, we should not take vengeance on the unbeliever. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He will repay the unbelievers finally at the final judgment, but God will often use other non-believers in this life to meet out his judgments on the non-believers. Let us not concern ourselves with doing that as Christians. Unless, of course, God has appointed some of us to be Christian magistrates, for example, when in the name of the Lord we must do this while we're magistrates, but never dream of doing it uh, during those hours of the day when we're not magistrates. Fourth, as Christians expand their reconstruction of society in all of its many facets towards society's Christian goal, Christians will need great tact and wisdom in dealing with non-Christians. I am just so painfully, painfully aware of this. On the one hand, Christians will remember that only God can convert sinners. Christians cannot convert sinners. Only God can. And God has converted us. Therefore, we will never seek to use force to compel non-Christians to believe in Jesus and to serve him because other Christians did not use force against us when we were non-Christians to compel and to convert us. They prayed for us. They gave us love when we insulted them. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4 verse 6. At the same time, Christians should not hesitate to use all legitimate means at their disposal to move against murderers, pornographers, adulterers, idolaters, 
and other anti-social elements in every area of public life. You know, and it's here that some Christians fall down. They see a man stealing uh, something that doesn't belong to him. The Christians will rightly desire that that thief be converted. <laughs> but in their over-desire that he be converted, they won't inform the police that he's stealing. Because they figure, wrongly, if I inform the police, and he gets to know that I informed the police, not only may he come and destroy me after the liberal judge has rehabilitated him, after giving him a three-month vacation in Alcatraz, complete with color TV set, but, worse still, he will say, well, if that's a Christian who told the police that I was stealing somebody's property, I will never become a Christian, and therefore, so we rationalize, I will lose his soul. Don't we get into these kind of situations so easily? Well, it's wrong. If we see someone stealing, we must inform the police. Because it's precisely when the, thief apprehend, uh, when the police apprehend him that the Lord is most likely to start working in the heart of the thief to straighten him out. So if you love the thief, please inform the police. And so on everything else across the board. It's when we refuse to discipline our children on account of a misguided, sentimental attitude of love we have to them. When we refuse to oppose our wife when she's wrong because we just don't want an argument. <laughs> when we take the line of least resistance, that we create all kinds of discipline problems which uh, are very difficult to straighten out later. So it's necessary for us to stand up and to be counted. Now it's true that Christians if they ever had the political power, should never seek to force a non-Christian to attend public worship. But it is essential that power-wielding Christians, when they do have the power, should prevent non-Christians from disturbing the public worship of Christians, such as by allowing not, uh, noisy Sunday games in a football coliseum right next to a Christian church during the hours of worship. Really, if Christians will not move against that football coliseum, at least to prevent the noise taking place during the hours of worship service, I would say the whole day Sunday, by the way, but at least during the hours of worship, we don't love the Lord enough to put that place out of business during those hours. Not only is our Christianity very flimsy, but we don't really love the idolaters <laughs> worshipping football <laughs> during the hours of worship on the Lord's Day at a time that they should be with God's people in church because all men should worship God. The fact that they don't doesn't mean that they shouldn't. Now, much as Christians should long for the non-Christians to be converted and to follow Christ, this worthy desire may never be allowed to immobilize Christians as it so often does into sinful silence at times when they should be speaking out and opposing the evil deeds of unbelievers with all of their might. And here is one, another huge problem of the churches today. Everybody's minding his own business. The Bible says, Thou shalt not mind thy own business. Thou art thy brother's keeper. We say, no, I don't want to be. Then we wonder why society is in the state that it is. It is only when Christians firmly oppose the works of unbelievers that unbelievers will ever respect Christianity and some of the unbelievers will be challenged to embrace it. If you were an unbeliever still, think back of the time when you were would you want to become a Christian if the Christians that you can see obviously loved their Christ so little that they weren't prepared to go and tell you look friend I've had enough you've just got to stop this now. what kind of a religion is that what's the power of communism the power of communism is that it requires sacrifices on the part of its adherents the power of communism is that Communists are proud to be communists and frankly they couldn't care two hoots what the non-communist thinks of them. And the feebleness of Christians is that they're so terribly concerned about what the non-Christians think of them and so 
really little concerned in the last analysis about what God thinks of them. These are hard words, but I'm afraid they're true. We will never convert communists to Christ until the communists can see (laughs) that we are more reckless, if I may use that word, in our Christianity than they are in their communism. Now, the road to the Christianization of world society is certainly long and rough. It is an anti-revolutionary road in which Christians must often be momentarily satisfied with small gains and concessions. But it is a road leading to victory. It is a road which must be trodden by God's children to its very end. You see, in the last analysis, either Christians will ultimately Christianize the world, while not Christians, but God himself will eliminate the wicked, or otherwise, non-Christians will ultimately de-Christianize the church, while both non-Christians and God himself will eliminate all wishy-washy pseudo-Christians who just will not stand up for Jesus and be counted even in the theater of society at large and in public life. Well, where do you stand in the fight? Will you stand up and be counted for the Lord and will you struggle through battle after battle unto victory? Here are some very relevant questions that we can consider as we develop this uh, and think about it over the next few weeks. First, what attitude should a Christian wife adopt toward her non-Christian husband? The answer, I think, is given in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, and 1 Corinthians 7, the whole chapter. Second, how should Christian employees relate to their non-Christian employers? Third, what should the endeavor be of Christian parents in respect of their non-Christian children And what should the aim be of Christian children in respect of their non-Christian parents? Fourth, should a Christian government, here's a very interesting one, should a Christian government give preferential treatment to commandment keepers or to commandment breakers or to neither? Before you appeal to a liberal misunderstanding of the U.S. Constitution, please read Romans 13. And recognize in reading it that Romans 13 is not even describing a Christian government but describing a non-Christian government. And so, how much stronger should a Christian government stand be on these matters if God requires even a non-Christian government to reward the good the commandment keepers, and to punish the evil, the commandment breakers. Fifth, should a Christian minority docilely submit to humanistic indoctrination by a non-Christian majority in one and the same school? I guess some Christians would say yes. (laughs) How else are we ever going to win the majority to Christ? I guess that's the answer they would give to that. Meantime, what's happening to our own children? as they're exposed day after day after day after day to the evil intended or otherwise but evil nonetheless to the non-believing majority six what about the role of love this is very important the role of love and compassion towards the lost as the Christians seek to conquer the non-Christians with the gospel you know There are some people I know who speak of Christian conquest of the world, but oh, oh, it's said so harshly. It's said with such a lack of compassion. It's said with such an attitude of we will destroy the scum of the world. And you know, when we talk that way, I think we forget for a minute that we too were scum before the Lord Jesus washed us. We must never forget what the Lord saved us from. And last, Should Christians, once they've gained power, ever seek to get even with non-Christians who have previously persecuted them? It's amazing how many Christians do this, try to get even, and yet won't admit that that's what they're doing. The Lord Jesus said, pray for those who despitefully use you. 
Don't allow yourself to be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. As far as it depends upon you. Live in peace with all men. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not yours. 